the presentation of Academia Europea's Gold Award to Professor Ole Peterson. The citation is the following one. This award is only rarely given and is made to those members and non-members of the Academia and to organizations in recognition of the contribution made to European science through inspiration, public support, management expertise, or by financial means. And it is a great pleasure for me to provide today the Laudatio. Ole, you have served our academy for very many decades. You have been with the Academy right from its beginning. You were on the picture that I showed earlier today of the founding event in 1988. Subsequently, you have served in numerous functions, our Academy, a section chair, physiology, as council member, and today board member. You have organized two annual conferences, first one in Liverpool, second one in Cardiff. You have been coordinator of a series of workshops of your section in Heidelberg at the Chira Foundation. You have been chair of the nomination committee for a very long time. You have been the architect of the class structure. And all of us have taken notice of the class reports given earlier this morning. And it's very clear that uh, the uh, creation of the classes has been a game changer for our academy. You heard the enthusiastic reports of the class chairs and uh, it's obvious from the response of the, uh, of the new members, how well this has been received and that basically this works. You have also uh, initiated the Cardiff Hub and you have served as academic director till the present day. And the Cardiff Hub plays a crucial role in our work in the scientific advice mechanism. It is the functioning of the Cardiff Hub that has given us a lot of credit uh, by our academic partners, the partner networks in SAPEA, but also by the European Commission. And uh, here clearly, again, you made the difference. You have served as vice president of Academia Europea, and uh, that made again the difference. And I have been very privileged that you were serving as vice president at the time that I joined the team as president. And uh, for me, really, it made a difference. It has been a true pleasure and a true privilege. While maintaining a top science career, you have done so much for the scientific community and for our academia in particular over 30 years. So in that sense, you evidently serve as a role model for our members. It is therefore with great pleasure and uh, it's also a true, truly an honor for me that I can present you today with the Gold Award. So I would like now to hand over the award and to ask you to come forward to stage. Normally this would be a handshake, but uh, that is not allowed by our local host. So <laughs> I give you with great satisfaction the Gold Award. And the official photographer has told you to stay for a little while. Thank you.
I would now like to invite Professor Olaf Peterson to present his gold medal lecture. Olaf, floor is yours. So thank you very much indeed. So uh, what I plan is, of course, a little bit overambitious. Uh, that's clear. The title is basically impossible uh, to, to deal with. And the only way I can deal with it is actually by making it a little bit personal. So what I hope to do is to show some glimpses that relate to what I have been personally involved in and hope that some of these elements may illuminate certain trends that have happened in the more than 50 years I have been active uh, in, in, in science and, and research. And there is a little bit of a subtitle, as you can see on the screen, which is not announced in the program, but also, as you will see as we go along, becomes quite important, namely that politics uh, frequently uh, intruded. Now, as uh, Seat very kindly mentioned and showed the picture this morning, uh, I was indeed uh, lucky enough that our inaugural president, uh, Sir Arnold Bergen, uh, invited me to be one of the uh, 100 uh, foundation members, and uh, even at a stage when I was uh, relatively uh, young. And I guess that's a reason that it is still possible for me to stand here <laughs> and, and start here that I was one of the uh, youngest, possibly the youngest uh, foundation member. But it has indeed, as uh, it says, I have had the fortune to uh, be involved in very many activities of academia Europe here, and I have served uh, all uh, presidents uh, so far, but uh, nobody has been closer to me as a president than Seat. That, that's very clear. And this uh, period as vice president has been a particularly remarkable one. Now, Academia Europea, and she had also mentioned that, is a young organization, and it's young when you compare it to some of the great uh, national academies of, of Europe that I show on the screen. Uh, they are uh, sometimes even 17th century creations or 18th century creations, and so with our 30 plus years, we are still, uh, we are still very young. Now, at the foundation meeting in Cambridge in uh, 1988, where I, I was present, the main discussion was actually whether Academia Europea should be a real pan-European academy in Charles de Gaulle's definition, stretching from the Atlantic to the rural uh, uh, Ural Mountains in Russia, or whether it should be a creation that was specifically linked to what was at that time still the European Economic Community, which a few years later, of course, became the European Union. And so that was the main debate at the foundation meeting. And the decision was made that actually Academia Europea should not be limited to what would eventually became the European Union, but actually should be a true pan-European uh, academy. So this, I think, was probably the right decision, but it has to be said that there was a price to be paid for it. And for many years, it was quite clear that uh, when the European Commission was established a few years later, the Commission did not necessarily see uh, Academia Europea as the natural body to provide uh, scientific advice for policy. It turned out that there were very many actors in Europe who wanted to do that. And actually, uh, this particular role of Academia Europea, which was very much in the mind of Arnold Bergen when he uh, basically created Academia Europea, actually only came into force during Seert's presidency. And this is the very great achievement of, of, of Seert actually, that he managed finally to actually fulfill the original vision of the founders of Academia Europea. Seert has already talked uh, a bit about uh, our involvement in SAPEA, standing for Science Advice for Policy by European Academies. And this uh, started uh, really uh, our involvement there with uh, when Seert became president of Academia Europea. 
The critical meeting, uh, we can see here in the lower left part of the picture, uh, was held at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, obviously uh, its home ground. And it was at that meeting in February 2016 uh, that actually the whole framework for SAPIR was established. It was also at that meeting that the name SAPIR uh, came up and which has actually stood us in, 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 in very good uh, stead. We have to remember now, and this is particularly also important for me because this is one of the reasons that I feel very strongly that this gold medal award is a, a really, uh, in a sense, uh, I don't really uh, deserve that because uh, the architect, of course, of the uh, SAPIR and the whole scientific advice mechanism was Robert Jan Smits. And you see a robot uh, here in the picture, uh, in the lower right part uh, of, of the picture, uh, standing next to Eva Contarosi, who happily is in the uh, audience here today. So uh, Robert Jan Smith is a true visionary, and he received the, was the last individual to receive the gold medal uh, from Academia Europea. So in that sense, it is uh, truly humbling for me here uh, to receive this award because he was, uh, is, the great uh, European visionary, not only the architect of the scientific advice mechanism, the architect of the ERC, and the architect, as we'll come to later, of the plan is for open access publishing. It's really a remarkable uh, achievement of, of, of a bureaucrat. Now, Seat made uh, the, for me, very important decision uh, right at the very beginning of his presidency that the major work of Academia Europea for the uh, scientific advice mechanisms should be coordinated by the uh, Cardiff uh, uh, Knowledge Hub. And I had the good fortune to be able to attract uh, as hub manager, uh, Louise Edwards, uh, whose picture is seen there to the left, uh, who has been a tremendous uh, force in driving forward uh, our work for, for, for SAPIA and has worked uh, literally uh, day and night for the Academy and for uh, Sapir. So I think uh, we, uh, and I will not talk too much more about Sapir because uh, she had already gave an excellent introduction to that earlier today. But I think with our involvement in Sapir, which has been uh, also, as she had mentioned, quite intensive and considerably, you know, quantitatively much more extensive perhaps than many other organizations would have expected, uh, Academia Europea has uh, entered the kind of center stage uh, in, in, in Europe. And uh, we are, of course, uh, very happy that this mechanism is continuing. Uh, as it also said that the present funding round will end at the end of April 22. Uh, and we will then start on, on, on a new period. And we are particularly happy, of course, that in the new period, the uh, Young Academy will join uh, th this mechanism. The Cardiff Hub has been also very closely in collaboration and we have organized many events with uh, the Young Academy and look forward to continue to do so. So at this point, I will shift gears uh, quite uh, sharply and uh, become a little bit more personal and go back in my life uh, very early on actually and think about European science development in a rather uh, broad context. So this is a picture of uh, Budapest, the way it looked in the summer of 1948. Uh, Europe, of course, was largely destroyed at that point. European science was largely destroyed at that point, uh, not only by the war, I have to say, it's important to realize, of course, that German science was destroyed not by the war, it was destroyed before the war by Nazi fascist policies where masses of the most eminent uh, scientists in Germany left Germany uh, for uh, other parts of, of, of the world. So this is a solitary reminder to all of us that bad politics uh, is extraordinarily destructive and can be almost as destructive as, as war itself. So, of course, at that point, uh, many uh, young people uh, felt that their future was not in Europe. And one of many people who took part in the post-war brain drain was the great Romanian scientist, George Palade, who received the Nobel Prize in 1974 for his work on the secretion mechanism of the exocrine pancreas. 
And I mentioned George Palade because this is my own research area uh, that became very, uh, and his work became very important for me. Now, George, uh, in his uh, Nobel Prize lecture, which as usual is published in, in Science, uh, given the citation there on this slide, uh, and to my great surprise, actually, but I can't deny delight, referred in his Nobel Prize lecture to one of my papers, uh, the reference 79, in the uh, science uh, article. And he wrote there, in the case of the pancreatic exocrine cell stimulation definitely leads to membrane depolarization. And he referred to a paper I published in the Journal of Physiology in 1973. So this depolarization he talks about is the reduction of the electrical potential difference across the membrane of the pancreatic acinal cell, the cell that produces all the enzymes that we need for the digestion of the food that we uh, eat. And George Pallada uh, discovered the mechanism by which a cell can export macromolecules without actually interfering with the integrity of the cell. And this uh, famous diagram I show in the lower right part uh, of, of the screen. But uh, Pallada also realized that uh, there has to be a control mechanism for this exocytosis. And this is in this context that he referred to this paper in mine, he saw that this depolarization was important for the initiation of the fusion between the granules containing all the enzymes and the plasma membrane, uh, whereby uh, the uh, enzymes could be exported. So as you can recognize here, uh, I, I was an electrophysiologist at that point and continue to be an electrophysiologist. But the whole area of electrophysiology underwent a dramatic revolution a few years later. And this was through the invention by two uh, outstanding German scientists, uh, Erwin Neher and Bert Sackmann, who received the Nobel Prize in 1991, basically for the invention of a new way of doing electrophysiology. And uh, I had the extraordinary luck to visit the Max Planck Institute for Göttingen where this uh, work had taken place in the autumn of 1980, actually only a few weeks after the publication in Nature of a key paper by uh, Erwin Neher. Uh, Erwin had actually discovered the so-called Giga Seal, that is the extraordinary interaction that occurs between the tip of a pipette with particular properties. You can see it in the uh, a lower uh, left part of the diagram here. So you have the pipette here, you have the cell, and you can get a extraordinary strong physical chemical interaction between the tip of this glass pipette and the surface plasma membrane. This is a electrical seal in the giga O range. So basically you physically isolate a tiny, tiny bit of membrane, a few square micrometer. And by this way, you can actually record directly the currents that flow through single uh, protein channels in the membrane. And I show here a recording from my 1982 paper. So this is actually uh, was an extraordinary important step because what actually happened is that electrophysiology was a way of doing direct molecular biology. Here we see directly the uh, closed state of the channel. Then it opens up, it closes again, it's closed, it opens again, closes again. So this is the way uh, these channel proteins work. They fluctuate in different configurations and only a few configurations correspond to the open state. Now, Avenir and Bert Sackman uh, are both neuroscientists. And they envisaged, of course, that their method would essentially be a major tool, and that turned out to be the case for neurosciences, because this is where obvious functions of ion channels are, are key. I mean, we cannot do anything, uh, move anything, sense anything without uh, ion channels uh, being act activated or deactivated. However, of course, I was not a neuroscientist and I am not a neuroscientist and I was interested in the types of cells that George Pallade uh, had investigated, epithelial cells, where it is not nearly so obvious whether ion channels are necessarily uh, so important. 
So actually, my 1982 paper, which I had uh, the privilege also of uh, presenting at the very first meeting, uh, patch plan meeting at the EMPO course in, in Erich in Sicily in 1982, was actually the first direct demonstration that ion channels existed in epithelial cells. And I still have a, uh, uh, a really uh, wonderful gift that I had a very, very nice letter from Bert Sackmann after I congratulated him on the Nobel Prize, where he expressed the view that for him, it was actually a very important step to see that ion channels were not only present in the nerve and muscle cells, but that they actually were of universal uh, significance. Now, nevertheless, as I said before, uh, it was to a very large extent and still remains today uh, the major tool for neuroscientists. And interestingly enough, this method that was fully described in 1981 is still today the state-of-the-art technique for all neuroscientists. It hasn't changed anything, actually. The technique is there. And uh, neuroscientists have made uh, phenomenal progress uh, in, in, in recent years. And uh, one such case, which is obviously uh, close to me uh, family-wise, uh, was made uh, by my, my son, Carl, who in 2008 uh, published a key paper in Nature, uh, which Nature actually thought was so important that they also published an interview with him in, in the same issue. And what he had achieved was actually to demonstrate that you could make concurrent recordings of, uh, with a patch clamp, patch clamp technique from neighboring neurons in awake behaving animals. So this is actually real physiology in real time and not work on isolated cells. Now, a few years later, uh, there was a quite different revolution, a political revolution. Uh, 1989, uh, in my view, could be regarded as an annus mirabilis. It's most certainly the most profound change of Europe's political landscape since the Second World War. It also so happened to be uh, the year of my very first visit to the uh, Soviet Union. And this occurred by the invitation from uh, one of our uh, members, uh, Oleg uh, Alexandrovich uh, Kristal, and uh, uh, both Siet and I were present a few years ago at a meeting in Kiev, uh, celebrating uh, his uh, round birthday. So this is actually quite amusing a drawing of him, uh, published when Nature had an interview with him in 2003. Uh, Oleg uh, is an extraordinarily creative uh, scientist, and he discovered uh, proton activated ion channels, which are actually the ion channels that are critical to sensing pain. And uh, there's a huge industry now in pharmacology of, of dealing with this. Anyway, he invited me to come to Kiev. Uh, and as it so happened, uh, his personal assistant uh, was what became my wife, Nina, who is sitting here in the audience today. And uh, so there was also a strong uh, personal interest in, uh, in, in this particular visit. Now, a few years later, uh, after I had begin, become foreign secretary of the UK's Physiological Society, the situation had changed very dramatically. And so on my second visit to Kiev, which was in 1993, of course, the Soviet Union had disappeared. Uh, Ukraine had become an individual country. And uh, I realized that the financial situation for many of my uh, scientific colleagues uh, in the former Soviet Union, but also indeed in Eastern Europe, uh, had deteriorated uh, quite dramatically. The Physiological Society uh, had considerable resources at its disposal. And so I decided and managed to persuade the board of the Physiological Society that we ought to use some of the surplus that the Physiological Society had to help those colleagues of ours who were less fortunate than we were. And we started uh, creating a number of support schemes. And I also realized that I needed a good administrator of the scheme. And so I appointed uh, Nina as the uh, society's uh, uh, lead administrator for this uh, support program. And we actually created a very substantial number of these programs uh, in, 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 in Kiev, in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, in Kazakhstan, in, in Bulgaria, in, uh, in Budapest, uh, also in Prague. So, and these were running for many years, actually, and gave direct salary support to individual scientists who we deemed were uh, of high quality. 
and who we wanted to keep in science rather than uh, go out of science and become businessmen as, uh, as happened in many cases. Nevertheless, and unfortunately, of course, we could not ultimately keep all these people in their places because the financial situation continued not to be very good. And indeed today, we are still in the European Union uh, in a situation where there are dramatic disparities in government budget allocation for research and development. And I think this, this is uh, a, a really uh, very bad actually, because it means that we are not uh, utilizing uniformly the talents that are present uh, all over Europe. So I regard this as a very serious problem. And if you look at the numbers here and compare the countries to the right with the countries to the left, you will see these are not small differences. They are huge differences. Of course, the UK uh, doesn't uh, appear in this table because we were stupid enough to <laughs> leave the European Union. And uh, we are now suffering all the consequences of that, as many of us had predicted. But another way in which bad politics uh, has uh, influenced things in a, a rather disastrous way. Now, this uh, disparity in uh, research uh, and development investment uh, is itself bad, but it is also dangerous actually in a world that uh, is changed very rapidly. And uh, one element of that is the obvious rise and rise of China. And uh, if we look here, not at publications in all journals, but look at publications in top journals, these are the journals that have been selected by Nature Index. You can argue about uh, individual journals that should be there or not. That doesn't really matter for the argument. The key point is to see the rise and rise of, of China. You will see that in some areas of China, uh, China has already surpassed the US. This is the case in chemistry. And if you talk to chemists, whether in Japan or in Germany or, or Britain, all knowledgeable chemists know that uh, chemistry in China now is uh, actually astonishingly strong. And they obviously see that as a extremely important key uh, topic uh, for the future. But it is frightening to see how, how this has happened. It's only really in the life sciences that the US still retains a truly a commanding lead. Uh, in the other areas, you can see uh, Earth and environmental sciences. China is gradually approaching the level of the US. In the physical sciences, uh, the situation is the same. And you can see that certainly China has already uh, surpassed uh, the kind of traditional strong science countries like Germany, the UK, and, and, and Japan in, in all these areas. So uh, we have to be uh, careful. And I think it is true to say that even those European countries who have made substantial investments in, in science and development, even those countries have not fully realized the competition that is necessary. And I remember recently speaking to a, a professor of chemistry in, 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 in Germany, and when I sort of said to him, well, you know, in, in Germany, you can be relatively pleased because you have much better support for science than we have in the UK. And he said, yes, yes, we are a little bit better than the UK. But he said, uh, we should really realize that even the German politicians have not realized the scale of the competition and uh, we will pay a heavy price for that. Now, uh, I actually came rather late to visiting mainland China. My first visit was in 2008 when I was a secretary general of the International Union of Physiological Sciences, and so I had the honor of opening up a major conference in, in, in Beijing, which is shown here in the lower left part of the screen. And uh, this was uh, a conference which also has become typical in the life sciences, the title of it, Physiology and Medicine, Bridging a Bench and Bedside. So this really relates to a very important question. Uh, so quite apart from the funding of the science, there is also the question of the benefits that science investment brings to uh, both society and to individuals. Specifically for the life sciences, there's always the question, do patients benefit sufficiently from the investments that have been made in, in, in the life sciences? And here, uh, I would like to pay tribute to Peter Hecke, who has uh, 
done more than most people to signpost the importance of uh, uh, translational medicine, by which uh, I think we mean the way of translating the knowledge that we have gained from basic science into real benefits for society and for uh, patients. So Peter convened a, a very nice meeting uh, two years ago at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences uh, on the cycle model for translating scientific results into community benefits. And uh, this became an Academia Europea position paper uh, published uh, in 2020 in the journal of clinical medicine. So the basic uh, cycle is shown here in the main part of the screen. Uh, you have problems with healthcare. There are certain uh, treatments that are not as effective as they should be. There are certain diseases that can't be treated at all. So there are questions. These questions uh, obviously should be taken up by basic scientists, by applied scientists, by clinical scientists, and that then produces knowledge. And this knowledge, of course, has to be published. It has to be published in the scientific peer-reviewed literature, but that's not enough. Uh, a lot of different policymakers, funders, and uh, communities have to be informed about this progress so that it actually can be implemented. And ultimately, the people who actually provide the treatment, the clinical practitioners, have to understand the progress in order that there is real benefit. When you then improve uh, the, the treatments, then of course, new questions come up because it turns out maybe you could do even better. So new questions arise and the whole cycle uh, starts repeating it, itself again. So this is a tremendously important, uh, important field now because uh, there certainly has to be a very strong place for pure discovery science. There's no question about that. But society has a right to expect that its investments in, 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 in discovery science actually also results in real benefits to the community and to individuals. Now, in my own research work, uh, we already uh, many years ago started to think about uh, not only the basic physiology of how things work, but also what happens in uh, pathology. And in the paper in 93, we uh, showed that whereas the normal physiological signals that also George Pallade was thinking about uh, uh, in his Nobel Prize lecture, uh, these uh, signals are actually localized. So we have small changes in calcium in certain parts of the cell that are important for the strategic control of secretion. However, pathological stimuli that result in a disease, they result in a dramatic global elevation of calcium, which is signaled by the red color uh, in this screen. And that actually is, uh, is pathology. We worked obviously quite a lot on that uh, for many years and uh, understood uh, gradually that these uh, global calcium signals that actually kill the cells if they're maintained for any length of time and result in uh, the disease, uh, acute pancreatitis, where the pancreas digests itself and its surrounding and uh, is a potentially very dangerous disease. It's also a major uh, risk factor for pancreatic cancer, which probably is the most uh, unpleasant way uh, to die. So we understood that there are some special calcium channels in the membrane of the cell that become overactivated. And we also saw that there were some small molecule uh, chemical uh, agents that could actually partially block that channel. And this is uh, shown here uh, in, in, in this slide where uh, a compound can markedly reduce the current flowing through channels uh, in the membrane and also dramatically reduce the degree of cell death introduced by agents that will uh, provide uh, 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 stimulus for creating this disease process. And very recently, to be completely up to date, uh, we have expanded this uh, theory that it is not only the secretory cell itself that George Pallade worked on, uh, but also other neighboring cells that all have exactly the same calcium channel. And so uh, I uh, believe uh, that there is a likelihood that in my active lifetime, we may uh, get a rational treatment for the first time of, of, of this disease 
in fact, clinical trials are at the moment in progress in the US uh, using uh, this approach. And the preliminary results from these trials are actually uh, quite encouraging. So now here at the end, I just want to talk a little bit about publication. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, Robert Jan Smith, in addition to being the creator of the ERC and the uh, European Scientific Advice Mechanism, also thought uh, more broadly about the whole question of publication. And uh, I think, uh, again, Robert Jan Smith's vision is really very impressive. So, I mean, he had this vision that everything that is published in the scientific literature should be freely available to everyone globally. And I think this is a really impressive uh, vision, actually. And it's still the case that this is not quite uh, achieved at this point. And so when he uh, finished his term as Director General for Research and uh, Innovation, he became a champion for the uh, open access uh, movement and created the so-called Plan S. Uh, and the S actually stands for Smiths. So this is uh, the Plan Smiths. Uh, and uh, Academia Europea uh, held a uh, conference uh, in uh, Leuven, at KU Leuven, which was chaired by uh, our board member, uh, Seo De Haan, and uh, was practically organized by uh, 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 Juliet uh, Davis from the from the Cardiff Hub. It's a very well attended meeting where we had a very good discussions about all the many aspects of uh, the open access program. I have to say that this is one area perhaps where I could imagine that Robert Jan may be a little bit disappointed because its progress has not been as great as we should. I think we again see that after uh, uh, he finished uh, his term and became uh, 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 rector, uh, vice chancellor of uh, Technical University in, in, in Holland. Uh, the people who succeeded him in the Plan S movement have not had the same energy and the same impetus. So we are still left in a situation where this problem is not as well solved uh, as it should be. And it just shows again the importance actually of having a powerful administrator who actually really wants things to get done. I also became personally a bit, and actually uh, one of the reasons I became enthusiastic was actually the dinner that was held after uh, uh, Robert Jan Smith uh, gave the gold medal lecture. And uh, I was lucky enough to sit next to him. And uh, he was so enthusiastic about this open access movement that it also infected me actually. So when just by coincidence, I was shortly after that approached by the American Physiological Society, asking me whether I would be interested in becoming the editor in chief of a new journal, complete open access journal that they plan to create. Uh, I, I said, yes, yes, uh, I think we have to do this. And you see a number of the journal is now functioning and is uh, publishing well, and we are uh, getting a lot of nice papers. And these papers are completely freely, openly uh, available to read by anyone, wherever they are in, in, in the world. There's still a huge problem, of course, because publication is not free. It costs money and somebody has to pay. And we still today, I think, have not yet achieved the kind of final stage where we have a good equitable way of making sure that this is done in a fair and uh, proper way. So I have come to the end of my talk. I want to end by once more uh, emphasizing my gratitude at having received the gold medal award and really thank, first of all, Seat personally, very strongly, but also the AE board. And uh, I have been, uh, as I said, an extraordinary experience uh, to, to work with you over these years and Academia Europea owe you an enormous debt for what you have done for the academy. So I will end here. Thank you very much for your attention.